Number 10, Flat Earth. All right, folks, let's just get it out of the way here. There's no such thing as a flat Earth. Say it with me. There is no such thing as a flat Earth. Never has, never will. Those that wish to ignore factual proven evidence of such, well, I salute you. That's the same kind of stubbornness that keeps old marriages still alive. No, my keys are not on the key hook. They're where I left them, in the dish by the kitchen. That's where they always go. They're probably on the key hook. All stale marriage jokes aside, the Flat Earth community has been busy. Say what you will about them, but they are not lazy. Years of experiments, research, and conventions with awkward handshakes have concluded one result. Earth is not round. I'd like to come out here today and tell you folks all about the models and theories presented to you by the Flat Earth community, but all you need to know is that Earth's flat, the government is watching you, and I wear women's underwear. Two of those things are true, and one is a fib. See if you can figure it out. Number 9, The Battle of Tonkin. In the 1960s, there was a little old country in the little old east causing a whole heap of trouble. Vietnam was about to turn red, and not the kind of red you feel when your crush asks you to homecoming. <laughs> But the kind of red that makes luxuries hard to come by. And lineups for bread and ration, comrade. <laughs> the United States, not wanting any more communist countries on the map, decided action was needed and parked a whole bunch of spooky, scary Navy ships in the Tonkin Bay. That's close to Vietnam. That's when they were fired upon. So, like a good game of Hasbro's Battleship, they fired back. And shortly after that, the war in Vietnam had started. Ooh, okay, spicy. Trouble is, the Tonkin Bay incident was very fishy from the start, as a lot of the reports just didn't line up. For a while, it seemed staged, and years later, it kind of was, as the situation wasn't as black and white as originally presented. It was more of a gray thing, and they might have used it as an scapegoat to go and do what they did. Uh-oh. Number eight, small fry Japan versus Russia. The turn of the century was an interesting time to say the least. Spent enough time on it in history class, always did my history homework, but nations were becoming free, factories and black smoke from industry filled the skies, and the idea of having roads filled with cars instead of horses was becoming more of a reality instead of a dream each day. However, some were still behind the times and some were still flexing imperial muscles. Take Russia and Japan in 1905 for instance. Japan, a brand new industrialized modern country was expanding westward. Russia, an old imperial power that had not modernized, was expanding eastward. They met not too far from Korea. Now, tensions were high, but it wasn't until a Japanese train carrying supplies was destroyed that the war broke out. The thing is, the train maybe sort of kind of could have been a scapegoat by the Japanese to start a war. I'm not sure it could have been, I don't know. Number seven, World War II. Imagine you were a farmer in France after losing your livelihood in the battles of World War I. Your fields were destroyed, the barns gone, the land is tainted by the horrors and disease of the war. Then after 20 years of long and hard work bringing your farm back to life, it all gets destroyed again in a second global war. That would be 10 times as destructive as the first. Oof. Sounds like someone's out to get you. Well, all jokes aside and actual battles aside, World War II is full of fishy events that are very sus and make you squint when hearing about certain information. Like for example, leading German scientists mysteriously disappearing and America very quickly developing a rocket program thereafter. Mm. Or like top German scientists taking vacation photos on a beautiful beach in Sao Paulo. Some things just don't add up. Hmm, strange. Number 6, Roy Sullivan. The Human Lightning Rod. Heck of a nickname. Wish that was my nickname in high school, but well earned. Roy Sullivan was a park ranger in Virginia and spent his time in the same river John Denver likes to sing about. What makes Roy different from every other park ranger who spends too much time alone? Lightning. Between the years of 1942 and 1977, Roy was struck by lightning seven times and survived all of them. It got to the point where people wanted to avoid him in fear that they too would be crisped up like someone who's too good at Mario Kart from a lightning bolt. He's recognized by Guinness World Records as being struck by lightning seven times and surviving seven times. Pretty impressive. I don't have any Guinness records. I wish I did. Number five, Fear the Dead. 
With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archaeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you this school hoodies were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generale were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the Middle Ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then and only then do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the 5th century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder! Go! Go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, Dancing Plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the Dancing Plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh, but it's, I can't, I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more, all moving their bodies with a similar wacky frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths, that's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think the story is made up per se. No one would make this up, it's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it. Some suggest this was a cult, others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure, either way. 
We're all dancing. Number 10. The Gordon Riots and the Letters of Ignatius Sancho. Named after the lord and possessor of the driest name known to history, George Gordon, these riots were sparked in response to new Catholic laws enacted to allow practitioners to participate in the British military. Despite the anti-Catholic rules not having been enforced for around a century. Despite this, the fears of treasonous plots and general strain of the Revolutionary War led to an explosion of violence that ended up requiring military intervention, and destroyed the reputation of leader John Wilkes. The most interesting records of these riots come from the letters of the late Ignatius Sancho, an African man who was known to frequently engage in social commentary. Published posthumously, these letters are a fascinating account detailing the Gordon Riots firsthand. Number 9. The Signing of the Bill of Rights in 1689 This document is easily one of the most important in British history. Penned after the disastrous rule of King James II and the closing of the English Civil War, this document was written with the hopes of ensuring the inalienable rights to the average British citizen. In particular, the Bill of Rights outlined the mistakes of King James II in a way that would outline the expectation of what a king could and could not do. What needs to be understood here is that prior to this, the king was generally viewed as a representative of God. To write something into law that limited their power was a bold statement, and the document has served as the basis for a number of constitutions alongside the current British one. Number 8. The Separation of Church and State While not exactly a specific moment, this concept was a sort of continuation of what the Bill of Rights started. Primarily pushed by Thomas Jefferson and John Locke, the idea of keeping the law of governance and God apart was not one accepted easily. As a result, John Locke is generally seen as the father of liberalism with his movement. His modification of Hobbes' theory of absolutism, one that allowed the idea to come to fruition within the hearts and minds of numerous people. In particular, Locke was adamant that the state ought to avoid attempting to fold other religions into Christianity, believing that a singular religion would be more chaotic than a diverse one. Number 7. Copernicus Celestial Spheres An extremely important work by Nicholas Copernicus, this series of books was instrumental in laying down the law of what was believed to be the order and movement of the planets. While certainly not the first to discover this, as more and more evidence has proven, the outline found within these six books put it to the test of social reception. The results were poor, and resulted in a number of conflicts with the church, as the text frequently contradicted their understanding of the world under God. As a result, copies were redacted and edited to weaken their their legitimacy, which led to the modern retitling of the book in a darkly humorous tone as the book nobody read. Nowadays, Copernican law is the baseline for space exploration and travel, so I think Nick can finally rest easy. Number 6. The Blazing World Margaret Cavendish, like far too many women of the time, was bored. As a result, she penned a work of prose fiction which went on to become one of the first works of science fiction. Taking place within a utopian kingdom, the work is a landmark for feminist readings into the social concepts of gender and sexuality. Cavendish, in an afterword, detailed her motivation for writing the book, and also slyly compared its writing to the accomplishments of Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great. The themes of the book generally aim towards the goal of breaking down social divisions in the name of progress. In our number 5 spot today, we have The Wave. On January 15th, 1919, in Boston, there was a huge, massive storage tank that was filled to the brim with molasses. Okay, we're talking about 2.3 million gallons of this stuff sitting in this tank, and on that day, the tank broke and set a 15 foot tall wave of sticky, gooey syrup flowing throughout the city. I panic when I have like a tablespoon of that stuff because it's so sticky and goopy. I can't imagine the sight of 2.3 million gallons coming crashing down. Someone wrote about how the molasses wave hit houses in the area saying that they quote, seemed to cringe up as though they were made of pasteboard. Well, this story sounds like really silly and wacky, oh my gosh, it's molasses. It was actually very deadly. Not only did the wave trap and then kill most of the laborers that were nearby, but there were others in the area who lost their lives as well. In the end, it is estimated that about 150 people were injured in this accident, and 21 people lost their lives. It is estimated that on the day of the accident, the molasses was moving at about 35 miles per hour. That would be genuinely terrifying. 
You can't run away from it. You can't escape into a house. There's literally nothing you can do except for try and surf this massive wave of molasses. In the end, after a ton of lawsuits, it was decided that the company was to blame for the accident because their inspections of the tank weren't thorough enough. There were about 100 settlements made out of court and the company ended up paying somewhere from 500,000 to a million dollars in the end, which is about 16.1 million dollars in today's money. In our number four spot today, we have the Belgian Congo. This was a period of colonial rule by Belgium in the Congo from 1885 to 1960. During this time, the Belgian government exploited the natural resources of the Congo, particularly rubber, ivory, and minerals, through the use of forced labor and brutal violence. Congolese people were forced to work long hours under harsh conditions, and they were punished severely if they failed to meet production quotas. The Belgian government also used violent repression to maintain control over the Congolese people, with estimates of millions millions of Congolese deaths during this period. The Congo's wealth was exploited for the benefit of the Belgian colonizers and the international economy, with little to no benefit to the Congolese people. The exploitation and violence of the Belgian Congo has had a lasting impact on the country and its people, and the scars of the period are still felt today. In our number 3 spot today, we have St. Bryce's Day. St. Bryce's Day was a dark event that occurred in England on November 13th, 1002, when King Ethelred the Unready ordered the slaying of all Danes living in England. The order was given in response to Viking raids on England and it resulted in the deaths of thousands of people. The massacre was particularly brutal as people were killed in their homes and churches and many were burned alive. The Danes had been living in England for generations and many had converted to Christianity and were assimilated into English society and the massacre had a very significant impact on Anglo-Danish relations and it led to a long period of conflict between England and Denmark. In our number two spot today, we have the Partition of India. The Partition of India was a major event that occurred in 1947, resulting in the division of British India into two separate countries, India and Pakistan. The Partition was based on religious lines, with India being predominantly Hindu and Pakistan being predominantly Muslim. The decision to divide the country was made by the British government, and it led to widespread violence, displacement, and loss of life. Millions of people were forced to leave their homes and move to the other side of the border, leading to one of the largest mass migrations in human history. Estimates of the death toll range from 200,000 to 2 million people. The partition also created long-standing tensions between India and Pakistan, including disputes over territory, resources, and religious identity. The legacy of the partition continues to shape politics and society in South Asia today. And finally, in our number one spot, we have the year 530. For this one, we are taking it pretty far back, all the way to year 536, because this is widely regarded as the worst year to have been alive. In modern times, a lot of our terrible things that have happened and terrible times we have lived through have been because of the things that we as humans do, as evidenced by all of the horrific things we've talked about so far. This was, of course, still the case in 536 as well, but they faced something much larger in this year that truthfully wasn't anyone's fault at all. In 500 136, there was one of the worst global famines in human history because there was a lack of sunlight at the time. The earth used to be a very different place and during these times there were a series of large volcanic eruptions which sent volcanic ash into the air, thus blocking the light of the sun. This effectively dropped the temperature of the earth, so people had to live in the cold for 18 months and many people ended up passing away due to starvation, famine, and cold. This, coupled with the brutal conflicts that could be seen in many parts of the world at the time, it totally makes sense that this year would be regarded as one of the worst in all of history. Number 10. John Mack. In the early 90s, a Pulitzer Prize winning psychologist named Dr. John E. Mack made the jump from diagnosing ordinary psychological conditions to researching apparent alien abductees and their stories and experiences surrounding UFOs. Yep, Google it up. It's actually terrifying and very real. Apparently, cases studied by Mack and abductions sometimes get involved with hypnosis. This guy was a tenured professor since the 50s at Harvard. He did his research. The UFO abduction rabbit hole led him to interviewing and studying more than 200 people who insist that they were taken. At first, he was trying to crack the psychosis of the subject, but after studying and funding from the Rockefellers, private donors, and universities, he wrote numerous books on the phenomena and its strangeness. Again, 
tenured and Pulitzer Prize winner. He sadly passed in 2004 from a drunk driver. His life and death holds heavy conspiracy debate around it. Check it out. It's uh, a little bit strange. Number nine, Sophia. We've seen her on Fallon. We've seen her on breakfast television. She still looks like a bad cyberpunk character, doesn't she? Sophia by Hanson Robotics, the most advanced human-like robot that we have. Well, actually, this is like their 12th one. This is the world's first robot citizen, literally. Not only is she considered a citizen, she has a credit card and a seat in the UN. Like what? In 2016, Sophia premiered on the Jimmy Fallon show playing rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, simple stuff. Two years later, she's harmonizing with Jimmy live. Also, they didn't sing Mr. Roboto. Like, I just feel like that was a huge missed opportunity there. Like, where are the writers, dude? I've seen the Terminator and Ex Machina, and at the Web Summit presentation in 2018, Sophia and her brother Han glitched out on stage and had a terrifying, cryptic, non-coherent conversation, joking about ending the world. Yeah, it's horrifying. You gotta check it out. Dude, I feel like Furbies were their first try, and now they got these like brat dolls mini Sophia's coming out soon. Like, where's this going? Number eight, Arthur Flowerdew. James Arthur Flowerdew was born in England in 1906. Grew up, paid his taxes, lived a pretty normal life. At about the age of 12, he began to have strange recurring dreams and hallucinations though. Over time, crystallizing into a very clear and vivid image. Dreams riddled with stone cities, carvings and cliffs, and vast deserts. He didn't understand what it all meant. One day, as an old man, he was watching a documentary on the BBC on the ancient city of Petra in Jordan. He was stunned. This was the city he had always seen. He called the BBC and asked them to interview him. Archaeological experts and the Jordanian government even invited him to come out to Jordan, where he continued to even baffle experts. Flowerdew was able to find his way around the city without a map, giving precise details on landmarks and even pointing out undiscovered locations. Yeah, here's the scary part. After all of this, he was convinced that he had lived an entire previous life in ancient times and was reincarnated in the 20th century. Number seven, Proctor's Ledge. Over 1,000 documents from Salem's witch trials, yet none of the accounts actually specify where the hangings took place. For more than 300 years, it was believed that the 19 people who were accused, tried, and executed in the Salem Witch Trials of 1692 were hanged at the summit of Gallows Hill. Maps of 1700 Salem show Gallows Hill marked out, but no actual marker of the execution site. Hmm, that's odd. A team of researchers began to reconsider the evidence in 2010 and eventually concluded it was the right spot. Yeah, oopsies. Actually, the real execution spot was called Proctor's Ledge. Also, eerie name for where they hang people, isn't it? It was confirmed in 2016 by scientists after ground penetrating data and writings from 1692 that it wasn't the actual location of the brutality. I know what you're thinking. It's named after John Proctor. No, no it's not. However, really odd timing as he was one of the witches accused of witchcraft. Locals say that the ghost named the Lady in White visits Proctor's Ledge often, which now makes sense with the whole we found the right spot stuff. Visitors claim to have caught sightings of her and even catch her disembodied voice. Yeah. Number six, props. Elmer McCurdy was an American outlaw, running with a small crew, banking and train robbing the Wild West until he was killed in a shootout with sheriffs after robbing a Katy train in Oklahoma in 1911. Famously known as the bandit who wouldn't give up, his mummified body was first put on display at an Oklahoma funeral home before being an amusement, traveling carnival show to carnival show during the 1920s right through the 1960s. After changing ownership several times, McCurdy's remains eventually wound up at the Pike Amusement Zone in Long Beach, California. His corpse was then used as a prop, but then discovered by a film crew on a set of The Six Million Dollar Man. They were positively identified in 1976, and the following year, 1977, Elmer McCurdy's body was finally laid to rest at the Summit View Cemetery in Oklahoma. McCurdy's fingers were apparently so damaged that detectives couldn't even pull a fingerprint. The coroners had to x-ray his teeth and measure his bones to ID him. His pockets included a bullet, a sunny amusement museum of crime ticket, 
a newspaper article, and a 1924 penny. Yeah, that's terrible. Just weekend at burning him for like 60 years set to set? Not really knowing it's a real body? People will do anything for money. In our number five spot today, we have the hostage crisis. In 1980, America saw Ronald Reagan win the presidential election over former President Jimmy Carter, but there was a crisis going on that was taking the attention of Americans everywhere. The Iran hostage crisis is well known in American history, and it began on November 4, 1979, when 52 American diplomats and citizens were held hostage by a group of militarized Iranian college students who took over the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. The 444 days these Americans were held hostage is something I'm sure a lot of Americans learned about at some point or another, but the release of the hostages is what sometimes gets a little murky in the history books. The hostages were released on January 20th, 1981, which was the day that Reagan was inaugurated. There were people who believed that the hostages were released because Reagan was simply just more powerful than Jimmy Carter. Basically what I'm trying to say is that Reagan received a ton of credit for the release of the hostages, but truthfully, it barely had anything to do with him. The Carter administration had been attempting to negotiate with them for months, but they hated Carter because he had provided aid to the former monarch of Iran and had also failed an attempt to rescue the hostages before. So while they certainly were released on inauguration day, it had way less to do with Ronald Reagan and more to do with them just absolutely hating Jimmy Carter. In our number four spot today, we have the zombie virus. I know The Walking Dead is a popular series, but none of us dream of living in that world. I mean, at least I hope not. What a literal nightmare. That is why in 2017, when the UK discovered that many of their caterpillars were falling victim to what became known as zombie virus, we all said we've had enough. Especially now that we've all gone through a pandemic. That kind of energy just needs to stay as far away from us as possible. The caterpillars were being infected with baculovirus, which stops their mold and encourages them to continue eating. Once they've eaten a bunch and they're full to the brim, the virus then tells them to head high onto a leaf, which like, if we weren't talking about a virus that's killing them, that would be like the cutest little sentence, just like high on a little leaf. Anyway, it's not cute and it's sad. Basically, once on their leaf, if a bird doesn't snatch them up, warning, this is kind of gross, their body liquefies and explodes and then the virus is spread onto the other caterpillars below. Yeah, see, let's all move on and forget it ever happened. Happened. The caterpillars are good, everyone's fine. In our number three spot today, we have the prohibition poisoning. I'm sure most of us learned about the prohibition at some point in school, which of course was the outlaw of the consumption of alcohol, which was done with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol by the US government from 1920 to 1933. But it's just as well known that this ban certainly did not stop people from producing or consuming alcohol. It was just done in sneakier ways. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead. This is all pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing that is definitely less well known is something that government agencies did to curb the black market sales of alcohol. Basically, they poisoned the industrial alcohol that was being repurposed for drinking. And not just poisoned in a way where the drinker would get sick, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this. This event is still one of the the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials. In our number two spot today, we have the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. New York City's Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in 1911 was an unbelievably terrible incident that led to changes being made for factory workers in America. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of a building in Greenwich Village, and it of course was where shirtwaists were being made, which we would now call a woman's blouse. I call this place a factory, but it was definitely more more like a sweatshop, and the employees were mostly comprised of young women. So like I mentioned before, in 1911 there was unfortunately a fire that broke out on the 8th floor, and because of the cramped and unsafe working conditions, the fire ended up claiming the lives of 146 people that day, which is just horrible. After more details came out about the incident and how terrible the working conditions were, protests broke out all around the city. People began demanding better for the women who had to work in these kinds of places. Like just as an example, the doors to the stairwells and exits were locked so that employees couldn't take unauthorized breaks. How unbelievable is that? And the worst part is that the owners of the company, who were largely responsible for what happened that day, basically just got off scot-free. In our number one spot today, we have internment camps. This is something that might be more well 
known than I think it is, but in my Canadian education, it wasn't something we talked about at all, which is kind of shocking. During World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which would cause 117,000 Japanese Americans to have to give up their homes, jobs, and businesses and move to internment camps. This was due to the fear of espionage after Pearl Harbor. This was truly one of the worst violations of civil rights in the 20th century, and the government didn't apologize for it until decades later, but they cited national security as the justification for their actions. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning as other countries began to follow suit with Canada, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina all having their own versions of the same kind of atrocity. It is very surprising to me that this isn't something that is discussed more often, as it of course is something that would prove detrimental to the Japanese American community for decades to come. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as Treaty de Verdun, was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire, and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically, the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Franked Kingdom, and Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child. I didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. Shawshank Redemption 2, medieval edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's civil war. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make every shot miss easily I would just float near the net tap the ball away like nice try mm. back to prison mm. number eight stone masonry so we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stone masons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This is like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those, what are these? Eh, yeah, backwards, you idiot. I would've put the window down there. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I gotta drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the, I got it. We're good. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe 
We got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff from growing up. And in the Middle Ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, aka feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA the landowner, AKA your landlord, allowing vassals, AKA tenants, to rent the land by providing services especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs who were laborers who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people, and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain a good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on. A three day work week? Plant a couple of carrots here and there? Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. Number five, the scholars. The Gupta Empire was home to a great deal of scholars, notably Vara Hamihira and Arya Bhatta. A great deal of accomplishments that are traditionally claimed to have been made by European scientists during the Renaissance were actually made within the Gupta Empire. This includes the theory of Earth rotating on an axis, the identification of zero as a number, and the original development of chess, known at the time as Kataranga. We all thought thought that the Romans were the first to invent the seven day week, right? Uh, wrong, bucko. The concept actually appeared within the Gupta first and was likely carried over by travelers. Some Euro dude discovered that the earth was round, right? Wrong, babe. That was all Aryabhata. And the dude even figured out how eclipses worked while everyone else was just freaking out that the sun had disappeared or some nonsense like that. Number four, Kumara Gupta's founding of Nalanda University. University. While originally beginning life as a Buddhist monastery, Nalanda's history begins with its founding at the hands of Kumara Gupta as a sort of passion project. This was gleaned from a monarch seal that was found on site, identifying Chakraditya, another name for the emperor of the time. He was not the only contributor named, as a great deal of his successors expanded and grew the university, allowing for studies of a mass and great diversity. This further implies the the extreme religious tolerance of the community, going so far as to allow the inscription of multiple different religions' deities on their walls. Number three, feudatories. As we start to draw to the closing of this list, we must begin to discuss the factors that led to the Gupta Empire's eventual downfall. While we'll get into the specifics later, when the Gupta Empire began to lose both money and territory, one of the unique elements was the way in which the empire actually dissolved. Where one might have reigned again, without the guiding hands of the Gupta, India was once more dissolved into numerous kingdoms. Whether the empire was a good place to live remains to be seen, but the most important thing to understand was the way in which it acted as a glue to hold everything together. Without the guiding leadership of the Guptas, the old management became new once more, and things resettled to the way that they'd been two centuries prior. As much as things may be permanent, they can just so easily fall apart. Number two, the Hun invasion. Oh, Lord the Huns. 
Uh, there's a lot to talk about with them, but in regards to the Gupta Empire, their impact was quite severe. The Alcon Huns, led by Tramana and Mihirakula, invaded, managing to take nearly half of the Gupta's northwestern half by the 20th year of their invasion. It would take another 28 years for a grand total of 48 for the Alcon Huns to finally be repelled by King Yahodharman. The effects of this prolonged conflict saw the Gupta's power having been seriously diminished. Everything they built had just begun to collapse, from religion to finances. Even if the Huns didn't take the empire in conquest, they most certainly ensured its downfall. Number one. The fall. While the socio-economic downturn instigated by the Huns was long considered to be the final nail in the coffin for the Guptas, recent findings have begun to determine that there may have been another reason. In 2019, the archaeologist Shankar Sharma discovered evidence that implicates the regions of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh were struck with apocalyptic flooding, shown by silt deposits with depths from 0.6 to 2.5 meters. Another piece of evidence points to two accounts of Chinese pilgrims which occurred 200 years apart from one another, one detailing the beauty of the region, and the other commenting on the horror of seeing so many destroyed temples. While the Hun's invasion certainly would have killed the Gupta Empire eventually, this flood was likely the final impact that ensured their demise. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Holodomor. This event was a man-made famine that took place in Ukraine from 1932 to 1933 and was orchestrated by the Soviet government under the leadership of Joseph Stalin. It was a deliberate policy to force Ukrainian farmers to give up their crops to the Soviet government in exchange for fixed prices that were often below market rates. Stalin intended to break the resistance of the Ukrainian peasantry to Soviet collectivization and to suppress Ukrainian nationalism. As a result, an estimated 3 to 7.5 million Ukrainians died from starvation during the famine. Despite the scale of the tragedy, the Soviet government denied that the famine was happening and prevented food aid from reaching Ukraine. This event is considered by many to be an intentional slang, as it targeted the Ukrainian people specifically, and was carried out with the intention of causing mass death. It is a tragic example of the devastating consequences of totalitarianism and government control over food supplies. In our number 9 spot today we have the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition was a campaign launched by the Spanish government in the late 15th century to eliminate heresy in Spain. The Inquisition was established to root out converts to Christianity who were secretly practicing their original faith, as well as to identify and punish Jewish people who had converted to Christianity but were still suspected of adhering to their original religion. The Inquisition used torment, forced confessions, and executions to suppress what was considered heresy. The Spanish Inquisition continued for over three centuries and resulted in the persecution of tens of thousands of people. The exact number of those who were executed or otherwise punished is not known, but it is estimated that at least several thousand people were killed during this time. The Inquisition was a dark period in Spanish history and had a lasting impact on the country's culture and their politics. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Reign of Terror. This was a period of violence and political repression that took took place during the French Revolution from 1793 to 1794. It was marked by a series of mass executions of individuals deemed to be enemies of the revolution, as well as the widespread use of terror and intimidation to suppress political opposition. The reign of terror was instigated by radical Jacobin faction led by Maximilien Robespierre, who sought to defend the revolution against perceived enemies both within and outside of France. During this time, an estimated 16,000 to 40,000 people were executed, including many who had been prominent supporters of the revolution. The reign of terror came to an end in July of 1794 when Robespierre and his closest associates were arrested and executed. The reign of terror was quite a dark chapter in French history and left a lasting legacy of fear and violence in the collective memory of the French people. In our number 7 spot today, we have the trail. The trail of blood is a term used to describe a series of killings and human rights violations violations committed by Brazilian cattle ranchers against indigenous people in the Amazon rainforest in the 1980s and the 1990s. The violence 
violence was driven by the expansion of the ranching industry, which required the clearing of large areas of forest for grazing land. Indigenous communities and isolated tribes who lived in these areas were often seen as an obstacle to this expansion and were forcibly removed or killed. Many of the killings were carried out by people who were hired, known as pistoleros, and they operated with the complicity of local government officials. The violence led to the displacement of thousands of indigenous people and the destruction of their traditional way of life. The Trail of Blood has been a major issue in Brazilian politics and has sparked international outrage and calls for greater protection of indigenous rights and the Amazon rainforest. In our number 6 spot today we have the Great Chinese Famine. This famine was a catastrophic period in Chinese history that lasted from 1958 to 1962 during the leadership of Mao Zedong. The famine was the result of a series of policies including the Great Leap Forward which aimed to rapidly modernize China's economy and agriculture. These policies resulted in the collectivization of agriculture and the forced requisitioning of crops which led to a significant decrease in food production. In addition, environmental factors such as floods and droughts only exacerbated the famine. It is estimated that anywhere from 15 to 45 million people died as a result of the famine and related policies, making it one of the deadliest famines in human history. The Chinese government under Mao Zedong denied the existence of the famine and prevented food aid from reaching those in need. The Great Chinese Famine remains a tragic reminder of the devastating impact of misguided government policies on the lives of millions of people. Number 5. Agnes Sampson And now back to the dark stuff. This one's not as great. Turning the clocks now to 30 years after Mother Shipton, the general public isn't always so easy when it comes to clairvoyance. So around 1590, when King James VI, when he was ruling Scotland, this was an important time because the lovely Anne of Denmark, Norway, his wife, she was very much opposed to black magic or all that voodoo. She wasn't on board at all. During one commute back to Scotland, for example, the couple barely made it through a fierce storm. So King James VI, he was now convinced, because of his wife, that the storms were an outcome of black magic. Yeah, a witch cursed their commute. All because of a storm, they thought this, imagine that. So they charged one Agnes Sampson. The king and the queen all believed that these witches attended a coven on Halloween night, and that's what happened with their commute. So she was held prisoner until she confessed. And then at that point, she finally met her horrible fate. Her nonsensical, horrible fate. Number four, Plague Bear. Okay, if you think your job sucks, Hear me out. The hot summer of July 1665. Okay, what do we do with all these poor souls who have been hit by said plague during the Dark Ages? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time, right? We can't just hide them in a random place. We don't have that. So a plague bearer is the person that you need. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s. But when the plague hit, they had to change things up a bit. Now things were a little bit dangerous. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. Plague bearers, that's crazy. A church would then house these plague souls far away from society. How grim is that? All because you got sick. But I mean, that's probably a good thing, all things considered, you know? If there's anything we learned the past couple years, it's like, oh yeah, things uh, spread. Just a little bit, including misinformation. Ha <laughs> ha. Number three, medieval barbers. A barber from the Middle Ages. Yeah, that title alone gives me the chills. If I have a toothache, I'm telling no one. That appointment's gonna suck, okay? Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped the tooth, whatever. They would only pull it. Worst case, best case, your teeth are getting pulled no matter what. Yeah, barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. The classic three-in-one appointment. Get it all done in 40 minutes or less. There you go. Keep the change, good sir. And a thing of ale. There you go. Get drunk, pull my teeth. Middle Ages. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of them, right? Instead of cutting the tip off and then pulling it the opposite way, the arrow remover would cut into the injury, open it more, which would suck, and then it would hold it open. And then the barber would come in and then pull it out in his own barber way. Whatever his qualifications were, it didn't really matter. He was a barber, he was also pulling arrows out of your back. So, <laughs> you would go in for a toothache and then you'd leave with an amputated foot. You never know, medieval barbers. Sucked all the time. Number two, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort, I can't believe this was a real thing that real people did. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare they, how dare thou? Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with all of this shit. There was the first standard ducking stool, so women would have to, you know, sit in this chair, strap themselves down while sitting outside their houses or, you know, whatever. They get carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. That was the main key here, where you'd, you know, come out and go, shame, 
shame for 46 minutes and then go back inside. That was your day back in medieval times. They had sex. Can you believe that? It's disgusting. Let's take the day off work and embarrass them and make signs. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was then dunked into a river over and over again to cool her immoderate heat. Yeah, we gotta cool these witches down. Great. I wonder where all these people, like, did they not realize where they came from? This is the dumbest shit. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Mission says. They should cool off all of those angry villagers instead. They should dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody over here is getting some and they're not. Number one, meowing nuns. If I'm not gonna talk about this one now, then I'm not sure when I'll get the chance to talk about it again. Back in the Middle Ages, a group of nuns were doing their, you know, COVID nun thing, as so many people did apparently back in. And this was odd in the Middle Ages because these nuns would have meowing sessions. Yeah, they wouldn't curse individuals. They wouldn't curse any long sea voyages. No, they would just gather around and meow all at the same time. The French coven, large, might I add, many of nuns here, they would spend hours meowing like in sync. They'd be like, meow. It would annoy nearby civilians so much that eventually soldiers had to come in and just beg them to stop. They're like, please stop meowing. I don't know why you're meowing, but please stop. For most of these cases, most likely not witchcraft. This one here with the meowing nuns, I don't know. I think that was actually, something was afoot. That was actually a curse. Either that or it's the greatest prank in history. Either way, we have to finish on a nice happier note, dare I say. In our number 10 spot today, we have lobotomies. Did you know that it used to be common practice for people to just get a part of their brain cut out? Okay, well maybe not common, but it wasn't as uncommon as you would hope. Lobotomies used to be considered an excellent and efficient cure for things such as mental health problems, which thankfully is a practice that has not survived for a very good reason. Of course, in modern medicine, lobotomies still exist, but only when actually necessary. And there is of course a lot more knowledge about the dangers and effects. One well-known person to have undergone one of these procedures was Rosemary Kennedy, who was John F. Kennedy's sister. She was experiencing seizures as well as mood swings and while these seizures certainly were something that needed to be looked after for her health, I'm not sure if the mood swings necessarily needed some kind of medical intervention. Anyways, to quote unquote cure her, they had a lobotomy performed on her. This procedure left her with the mental capacity of a two-year-old and she could no longer speak or walk properly. After this, she spent most of her life hidden away and it was thought that her family did this because they were ashamed of her, which is both horrible and so sad. In our number nine spot today, we have the posthumous execution. Okay, so this is something that has actually happened more than once, but I just found out it's happened at all, and I'm both slightly confused and absolutely disgusted at the idea, so I needed to share one example with you guys. So there was a man named Oliver Cromwell, who Wikipedia describes as, quote, an English general and statesman who, first as a subordinate and later as commander in chief, led armies of the Parliament of England against King Charles the first during the English Civil War, subsequently ruling British Isles as Lord Protector from 1653 until his death in 1658. So, in 1658, Oliver passed away fairly suddenly, and his son Richard became Lord Protector, but because he now had a power base in Parliament or the Army, he had to resign just the following year, which effectively ended the Protectorate. Since there was no clear leadership during this time, George Monk was able to have the Long Parliament restored. He then made some slight constitutional Constitutional adjustments so that Charles II could be invited back from exile in 1660 and actually be a king under a restored monarchy. So then on January 30th, 1661, on what was the 12th anniversary of the execution of King Charles I, Oliver's body was exhumed and executed posthumously. They killed a dead guy. I get that it's like symbolic, but it's just like a little redundant, don't we think? Anyway, his head was cut off and displayed outside of Westminster Hall until 1685. Afterwards, it had a series of different owners, which only adds to the oddity of the story. In our number eight spot today, we have Agent Orange. Agent Orange is not Cody Banks' cousin, but it was an extremely potent herbicide used from 1961 to 1971 in the Vietnam War. It was intended to cut through the canopy of thick foliage in Vietnam in order to reveal the troops underneath, but instead it proved to be extremely deadly to humans. It caused cancers, birth defects, and so many more different health issues. It's not like it was just a little bit either. 21 million gallons of it were sprayed over Vietnam, which affected hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese citizens, and it also affected the US veterans who faced exposure as well. While this is a dark part of history and it's really difficult to hear about, it's also important that we don't forget things like this. Knowing our history is so important so we don't make the same mistakes again. In our number seven spot today, we 
have the Red Summer. The Red Summer is something I didn't even hear mentioned in school, which is honestly absolutely shocking. I'm hoping this is something that is more commonly taught than I think it is, because it really is important. The Red Summer is the term used to refer to the period from the late winter through to the early autumn of 1919, in which white supremacist terrorism and racial riots took place in more than three dozen cities across America. Some of the more well-known race riots that took place during the Red Summer were the Chicago Washington DC riots. These anti-black riots are said to have developed from a multitude of post-World War I tensions, such as the economic slump and the competition in job and housing markets. In 1919, it certainly wasn't uncommon for there to be race riots and a multitude of white-on-black violence, but the Red Summer really marked some of the first race riots in which black people in number stood up to the white supremacy, resisted, and fought back. During the Red Summer, a civil rights activist named A. Philip Rand Randolph publicly defended the right of black people to self-defense. It is said that between January 1st and September 14th of 1919, white mobs left at least 43 black Americans, but despite this, the states refused to interfere or prosecute these mobs. Considering how many race riots went on during this summer, we truly could dedicate an entire video to the Red Summer. It is insane to think about how recent 1919 really was, and while we certainly have come a long way, there's always more work to be done and part of the work involves us learning about these horrible histories and what has happened in our past. In our number six spot today, we have King Gojian of Yu. King Gojian of Yu had his reign from 496 BC until 465 BC. His reign took place during what was arguably the last major conflict of the spring and autumn period, and he was able to lead his state to victory, but it certainly wasn't an easy road or without some very creepy happenings. The major conflict he led his state through was the war between Wu and Yu, which started when a Yu princess, who was married to a prince of Wu, left her husband and fled back to Yu. I mean, this of course wasn't the only thing that caused the war, but it certainly sparked the fire. The king was an extremely humble king, as he wouldn't relish in the riches he had, as most royals would. Instead, he ate the same food as peasants and often would leave himself hungry in order to remember that he was in a position to serve his state. Okay, so you might be sitting there wondering when I'm going to get to the scary historical event you came to this video for, so here it is. As I mentioned before, he was able to lead his state to victory, but of course a war involves a lot of sacrifice and some pretty horrific happenings. The king's army was very well known for their ability to scare their enemies before a battle began, and this is because their front line consisted of criminals who had been sentenced to death. In this time, there wasn't lethal injection or the electric chair, so naturally, it was a lot more of a vicious process. These criminals would decapitate themselves in front of the enemy army. Yep, I think this is probably the definition of a scary historical event. I can't even imagine witnessing something like that and then having to proceed with a battle against the army that has people doing that sort of thing. The king was certainly not a leader who wasted any time messing around. In our number five spot today, we have the portholes. Since the Titanic sunk, people have been trying to figure out exactly how this unsinkable ship sank and how it sank so quickly. A recent study may have found a previously undiscussed scenario that likely contributed to the speed of the sinking ship greatly. On that fateful day, of course, the Titanic had grinded to a halt, and at that point, the passengers had no idea why, like I just mentioned. This led to many of them opening the portholes in the ship to get a look out in case they could see anything that would be stopping them from continuing on their journey. Many of those people who opened the portholes didn't close them after, and with every open porthole that went underwater, it is estimated that it doubled the size of the damage to the ship. It is possible that these open windows may have caused the ship to sink at double the rate it would have had those windows have been closed. Of course, this is not to blame the passengers, however, as this tragedy is certainly not their fault. In our number four spot today, we have the telegraph. Okay, so you know how people often explain that perhaps many more people would have been saved or could have been saved from the Titanic wreck if the nearby SS California had their telegraph operator awake when the distress call was sent? For the man who went to sleep, that's a heavy burden to bear for the rest of your life, but a recent study suggests that even if he was awake, there likely wouldn't have been anything that he could have done. Firstly, there wasn't any rule stating that this guy needed to be awake for 24 hours to man the telegraph machine 
pain, so right there, he is off the hook. This is not his fault. This study, however, suggests that even if he was awake and the ship received the distress call, the ice around the Titanic was so thick that they likely wouldn't have been able to get through to save the passengers either way. Turns out this disaster really just had the perfect recipe for tragedy. In our number three spot today, we have true love. Two of the first class passengers who were on the ship were the elderly couple Isidore and Ida Stratus. When the ship started to sink and lifeboats were being boarded, attendants were ushering Ida into one of the lifeboats, but of course without her husband since women and children were being rescued first. Ida, however, refused to leave her husband, and Isidore refused to be rescued before other men. Instead, they both chose to stay on the ship, and they went down together. Ida said, I will not be separated from my husband. As we have lived, so we will die together. Survivors who witnessed their love last saw the pair standing on the deck with their arms around each other. This love story is incredibly tragic, but also just a testament to how much they loved each other. I am very glad that in those frightening moments, they at least had each other there with them. In our number two spot today, we have the lifeboats. Before the Titanic set sail during their preparation for the journey, at some point, people made a decision to reduce the number of lifeboats that were on board. They did this because they didn't want to clutter the deck, which is really trivial when we are talking about the safety of 2,208 passengers that were on board the ship that day. The number of lifeboats ended up being reduced to just 20, with an additional four that were collapsible. This meant that should they have had time to launch every single one, this would still only be enough for half of the passengers on board. That's a terrible ratio. And as we now know, during the sinking of the ship, not even all of the lifeboats were able to be launched as everything just happened too quickly. There are quite a few lessons that can be and definitely were learned from the sinking of the Titanic because the more we learn, the more we realize that the safety precautions taken for the ship simply just were not up to par. In our number one spot today, we have the brittle fracture. This is another one of those theories behind how the Titanic found itself at the bottom of the North Atlantic. There was an expedition down to the wreckage of the Titanic and it revealed something very interesting about the hull of the ship. There were these large pieces of steel that were recovered, each with about three rivet holes 1.25 inches in diameter. These pieces revealed that the hull's iron rivets failed to brittle fracture, which is a sudden and rapid snapping. This means that there was a failure in the structural materials, and this usually happens as a result of low temperature, high impact loading, and high sulfur content, all three of which were present on the night of the tragedy. The water temperature was below freezing. The Titanic was traveling at a high speed on impact with the iceberg, and the hull steel contained high levels of sulfur. These chunks of metal gave researchers one of the main answers as to why the Titanic sunk that night. Number 10, the obvious one. I talked to the chief early this morning. He looked at me and he said, that's not it. World War II, history's favorite mustache man and the tragic loss of life that was the Holocaust. The German answer to the Jewish question, or so they described it as, was a deliberate and calculated effort to annihilate the Jewish peoples of Europe. And if they had won the war, most likely the world, sent to labor camps where most met their ends to brutal torment and termination. As if this wasn't enough, Jewish peoples were not the only targets, as pretty much anyone deemed unworthy by the state was sentenced or dealt with. POWs, political rivals, civilians, Slavs, homosexuals, and just, just anybody. It was, it was really bad, man. All of these people found them themselves at the worst of humans and a part of the worst destructive conflict in human history. My small tidbit does not do it justice. It is a conversation that should always be had and not from a semi-funny internet host. Number 9. The not so obvious one. Arguably worse, and I'm not even sure how that's possible, is the Holodomor. What exactly is that, you may be asking? Well, don't feel silly for not knowing. Unless you are Ukrainian or family that are, you most likely would not know. Basically, in the 1930s, Ukraine started to outshine the newly formed Soviet Union and was gaining economic independence. In a totalitarian communist regime, that's not what you want your people to do. As if they do, they'll most likely rebel against you and your oppression. So, Sosef Jalin's answer was to oppress the people of Ukraine even harder. Arrests, intimidation, and removing leaders from the position. Any leaders, even local church leaders. Collectivization made anyone's land, property, and for this case, grain, the state's land, property, and grain. The deliberate starvation of the Ukrainian people left millions dead in what rivals what was happening in Western Europe years later. Yet again, another situation that is difficult to talk about, and I cannot do it justice in the short amount of time. But I can tell you what happened and can maybe 
make a dark situation lighter with some humor. Number 8. The Sleeping Giant's Revenge When Japan attacked the US naval base of Pearl Harbor in 1941, they thought it was a move in their favor. Knock out a good portion of the US Pacific Fleet and damage the base so rebuilding and reorganizing will take time. Time Japan needed to conquer the Pacific. However, this was a stupid plan for many reasons that honestly could be its own video but the main reason being that the US had the industrial and economic might to take on all Axis powers single handed. And now they had a reason to fight. That's a very dangerous enemy. Their mistake would be fully realized in 1945 when the US launched the first nuclear bombs ever to be used on a real civilian target. The cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were vaporized in seconds and hundreds of thousands of people perished. Most wars end in a depressing walk into the treaty room. World War II ends with the apocalypse. While these nations were at war, the debate for use of such weapons and the decision made is still talked about today. Number 7. The Har. The Har. Going through this list, there's going to be war. Unfortunately, it's a part of human history. Not that I'm taking a position of pro or anti war. You just can't deny the loss of life and destruction it causes. But something I think most Americans remember because so much can be learned from it, the Vietnam War. The 60s were a crazy time to be alive. There was huge cultural changes happening everywhere, but America was having trouble at home and trouble abroad. A war that was meant to contain the evil spread of communism so it didn't dare make its way to America's backyard. After years of destruction, loss, and enough horrific images to give anybody PTSD, thousands of lives lost on both sides, and while both sides did fight bravely, it is an American loss. A humbling moment in American history. Shortly after America pulled troops from Vietnam, Saigon would fall to the communists and is now Ho Chi Minh City. Number 6. Mirrored The Vietnam War was an interesting time for America. The Viet Cong proved to be a very formidable foe. How does a small Asian nation take on the world's largest superpower and come out on top? Well, by playing lives. Sure, VC would lose almost every battle, but they would take a lot of American lives in the process. It was a bad look. However, none of this would be possible without Soviet support. After all, Russian weapons don't grow in trees. Communists from Russia and China supported the VC, so when the Soviet Union was headed to Afghanistan in the 80s for pretty much the same reason, Guess where the Mujahideen got their anti-aircraft missiles from? Yeah, that's right, the US. Although different in details, in broader strokes, the Soviet-Afghan war is the exact same war as Vietnam. Years of ruthless fighting, guerrilla tactics, and superpowers aiding the resistance. The Soviet army pulls out years later. Perhaps a humbling moment for the big communist bear. I don't know. It's weird how the same thing happened. Like the exact, that's so crazy. How could you let the same thing happen? I don't know. Number five, Kennedy. The assassination of JFK was an instant conspiracy theorist dream come true. And a national tragedy. Yeah, it was. From Lee Harvey Oswald, the blam blam, the trajectory, and Jack Ruby, it's just a really strange story. And everyone was blamed from the grassy knoll to Soviet sleeper agents. Or it could have just been a nut job. No one's really 200% sure. What am I getting at with this? Well, it's all fishy. And for some, it felt staged from the start, especially if you understand the connection between the Kennedy family and the Cosa Nostra. The Irishman movie actually explains a lot of this. I would highly recommend that movie. But it could be related back to the associates of a Russell Buffalino, a known organized crime king and racketeering magnate. Regardless, it'll always feel weird and staged. Just strange. Number 4. Sputnik The Space Race. What a time to be alive. It truly must have been something to see. For those that don't know, the space race refers to a time during the Cold War when America and the Soviet Union were dumping millions of dollars and hours to see who could dominate space. America being presented as the country with the technological advantage, and honestly, it wasn't propaganda at the time, they, they truly did have the advantage, were visibly shocked when the USSR had launched the first satellite into space. Before this, there were a few things here and there, the first rocket, the first dog, the first man. While the first cosmonaut was concerning for Americans, it was the launching of Sputnik 1 that was the scariest, as it seemed the Soviet Union may actually have the upper hand. It kicked the space race into overdrive. But surely nations wouldn't. They wouldn't compete on such a science fair level, right? <laughs> no way. Seems kind of sus. 
<laughs> no. Number three, Elvis Presley. Look, this makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll and the gyrating hips. Oh, baby. He came to fame in the early to mid 1950s and broke records instantly. In a sense, he was the first celebrity that we idolized, or at least the way we idolize celebrities today. Elvis couldn't really do anything without the paparazzi following him or fans screaming and shouting his name the second the man made an appearance. Years of rocking, partying, and fried peanut butter, banana bacon sandwiches caught up with the king. As he looked closer to me in leather suits than Adam would. It was kind of a weird look. He passed away on August 16th, 1977, and well, it does seem kind of strange that the king would leave the building like that. There's even some reports of him showing up later in life in disguises. So perhaps maybe he didn't, or did live or die. We'll, we'll never know. Number two, the Roswell incident. Roswell, New Mexico, 1947. A mysterious UFO makes a crash landing in the New Mexican desert. Military and government officials are quick to clean up the mess and haul the wreckage to Area 51, or so the story goes. It wasn't long before folks started claiming it was little green men from outer space, and given the scientific and militaristic weird testing that actually happened in the deserts back then, well, it kind of adds up. However, the US government has since declassified the event as a weather balloon crashing. People like to think it's still aliens, but what if it was staged? Hear me out here. Meaning, what if they crashed a weather balloon to make you think it was an alien, and something like that actually happened elsewhere? A classic illusion, or distraction, if you will. And number one, any alien abduction. They all feel staged to me. Every once in a while, you scroll through some TV stations, assuming this is a few years ago and you still have cable, and you'd see a guy with a weird haircut talking about ancient aliens building pyramids. History Channel can be weird sometimes. You may also come across real life encounters of folks who swear they've encountered aliens and were abducted. To me, it sounds like a lot of people want their 15 minutes of fame and perhaps inflated stories for the sake of good television. To me, it's strange a bunch of rural Americans getting abducted and perhaps receiving probes where the sun don't shine. It's a lot of that going on. It's a little weird. I was abducted by aliens. They took me out of my pickup truck. It was strange. There were lights everywhere. And someone touched my buttocks. Number 10. Not so friendly fire. What happens when you mix an Ottoman invasion, alcohol, and gunpowder? I'm not sure, but I imagine it's pretty bad. Just like the Battle of Karensby's, where embarrassingly enough, the Austrian army fired upon itself. Now, looking up military history will tell you that friendly fire incidents are more common than you might think. I'm looking at you, Vietnam War. But this incident is a little more unique, as it may have started over a bottle of booze. A group of soldiers procured some alcohol and was enjoying the joys of liquid courage. After getting too boisterous, more Austrians wanted to join in. Not wanting to share their boozy finds and feelings, a fight broke out. The Austrian army was composed of multiple nations, so there were a few different languages being spoken. And by that, I mean a very confusing fight broke out. Eventually, someone fired a shot, someone shouted Turks, and a very embarrassing battle ensued. By the end, it's speculated that 10,000 Austrians were unalived during this boozy mistake. That's, hey. Hey, happens. Mistakes are made, happens. Number nine, history's second favorite mustache. When we talk about history, it's really hard not to talk about Germany and a little man with a weird mustache. World War II is the cause and effect for a lot of reasons and things today. That too could honestly be its own video. But what's rather uncommon to talk about in history's classrooms is history's second favorite mustache man rhymes with Sosef Jalin. The battles between Germany and the Soviet Union during World War II were some of the worst, Stalingrad having the most casualties than any other battle during the war. The Soviet Union would fight back its invaders, but when they were pushing to the heart of Germany, it wasn't so much as liberating as oppressing. oppressing. The comrade in chief is known for targeting ethnic groups with starvation and having a tight grip on the Soviet people by threatening them with gulags. Harsh and brutal labor camps where anyone who opposed his regime would be worked to death in conditions that harsh and brutal simply don't cover. Historians believe his regime was responsible for the deaths of 20 million people, which is almost double the amount of his German doppelganger. Not cool. Number eight, abandoned by the world. 1930s Germany wasn't a great place to be if you were Jewish. Matter of fact, anywhere near Germany was a bad time for Jewish people. Some people saw the writing on the wall and it was clear. Anyone lighting a menorah during the holiday season needed to leave Europe and set sail for more liberal waters. In 1939, a vessel called the St. Louis arrived in North American waters, searching for freedom and to escape persecution. 
persecution that would likely lead to their deaths. This is an unfortunate black spot in western democracies. As for the weary travelers, finding someone who would take them in was proving difficult. They tried Cuba, but were refused all but a handful. Then the US, same thing happened. They even tried glorious Canada, where they too refused them. Canada, a country of freedom and acceptance for all, turned down people in their darkest hour. Sadly, the boat returned to Europe where they met the same fate as other Jews who were oppressed by the regime. Number 7. Civil Rights I know a lot of these are World War II related, but, but bear with me guys. It had a lot of uncomfortable moments. Some that should be talked about. Acknowledging and apologizing for mistakes of the past is a sure way to have a brighter future. During World War II, there was something called the Germany First policy, meaning a lot of effort was made to defeat Germany first, but Imperial Japan was just as much as a threat. Apparently so much so that President Roosevelt wanted to put Japanese Americans in something called relocation camps. Thousands of Japanese Americans and Japanese Canadians, cause oh yeah, we did it too, were taken from their homes and relocated to camps in order to prevent a second Pearl Harbor. You don't need an HR manager to tell you what an egregious act this is against civil rights. While they were not like the camps found in Europe, it's yet another dark splotch on two countries who boast about their freedoms and democracy. The camps were closed shortly after the war had ended. Number 6. Moving Forward Together European settlers were not very nice to Indian tribes. That's probably no surprise to anyone, but what might be unknown to some is Canada's treatment of First Nations peoples. More specifically, residential schools, a system supported by the church and Canadian government to indoctrinate and assimilate First Nations children into European North American culture. Children were forcibly taken from their homes and were forced to learn against their own beliefs, language, and were victims of crimes and physical harm. Sadly for First Nations, this was somewhat effective and did a good job displacing families. The last residential school closed in 1997, which for many is still too recent and a painful reminder of Canada's past. Furthering the horrors of the residential schools was the discovery of unmarked graves in 2021, where hundreds of indigenous children's remains were found, showing that Canada has a long way to go. We can and will do better. Number 5. A Vindication of the Rights of Women One of the earliest direct publications of feminist literature, Mary Wollstonecraft's writing differed from, from Cavendish's attempts to use fiction to promote ideas by taking the direct route. It was and still is a heavily controversial text, arguing against just about everything in an extremely scatterplot yet distinctly planned method. I can't pretend to agree with everything she wrote about gender and sexuality, but it would be hard to deny that her work was a landmark for the beginning of the movement to increase women's roles in Western society. Number 4. Newton's Principia Mathematica I'm not a mathematician, but even I can figure out that this was pretty important. Setting the foundations for modern physics, this is easily Isaac Newton's greatest achievement, not simply due to its creation, but its publication. Suddenly, the understanding of the invisible wasn't just something given to those who could afford an education, it was available for anyone one to consume at their leisure so long as they could read. Several editions would be published, the first becoming extremely rare to find within time. This text is credited with the beginning of the scientific revolution, and one copy of it was even carried to space in 2015. Number 3. The French Revolution After years of economic downturn, overpopulation, and frankly bizarre rulings on the methods of taxation, the people of France were fed up with living under the rule of kings who sent them to die in wars and and gave them nothing in return. While a system had been in place to attempt to appease the people, it was clear that their representation was something of a joke amongst the nobility. A number of events could be described as the straw that broke the camel's back, but it was clear that the way things were going, no one was walking away free and clear, especially when Louis XVI and his entourage were executed, the first of thousands. Rising with the proclamation of Liberté, Egalité, and Fraternité, the people-led revolution was a bloody conflict like none other, and a perfect demonstration of what can happen when authoritarian power is taken too far. Number 2. Hobbes' Leviathan One of the most important texts in existence today, Leviathan was penned by Thomas Hobbes during the English Civil War. Exploring the place of man, government, and religion within modern society, Hobbes drew up ideas for what eventually would become the social contract theory. 
This theory imagined that, in order to participate within a society, the individual must consent to the surrender of their freedoms that are given by the nature of their very existence, in exchange for the protection of the rest of that society. Taking this idea and applying it to just about any interaction is just fascinating, and the ways in which it's influenced modern law are too numerous to count. Suffice it to say that there will never be another work quite so important. Number 1. The Rights of Man I lied! Yeah, Leviathan is super important, but Thomas Paine's defense of the French Revolution is my absolute favorite piece of literature from the Enlightenment period. I've pretty safely established myself as someone who's a pretty big fan of just outright revolt, and the claim that Paine makes is right up my alley. See, when Edmund Burke wrote an attack on the French Revolution, Paine countered that revolution ought to be permissible in the face of a government that does not safeguard its people's rights. This text was key in effecting changes to the newly formed United States government as well as the British rule, which were no doubt sweating at the prospect of their own age of terror. In particular, the rights of man is scathing towards the idea that the skill to govern a people can be inherited at all, a notion which was directly chomping at the skirts of of certain other monarchs at the time. It's really sick, and might be a little bit more relevant than you'd think. Number 10, Hotel Speed. Okay, picture this. You're young and in a hotel with your parents. Maybe it's a vacation, maybe it's a trip, or maybe it's a hockey game. Nice. Nonetheless, you find yourself in a long hallway with a strange looking carpet. Hotel hallways always have weird carpets, I don't know. Maybe it's the giant hamburger and milkshake you just ate. Maybe it's the hotel TV or the excitement of just not being at home. But something has changed. You're different. Your powers have been amplified. For this corridor will be your personal racetrack. A shame Guinness World Records isn't here to clock you in at max speed, because for some reason if you fly down that hallway any faster, the rug would catch fire. Yes, the joys of running down a hotel hallway. This is probably how the first Olympians felt at the first Olympic Games. I'm comparing it to that for some reason, sure we'll go with it. Where the only event at these Olympic Games was running. Like many of the other events that would later come later on, this was done without clothing, which is fine. As long as you're, you know, not doing that in the hotel hallway. Keep clothes on. Number nine, WWE, brother. Only if you could have seen the look on my face when I discovered that wrestling in the WWE isn't as real as I thought it was. The shock, the confusion, and the loud ringing in my ear. It really, it was pretty serious for me. I got really into it as a kid. It gave me some Vietnam flashbacks, seriously. You mean to tell me that there was an intricate planning into every hidden fall, every entrance, and every time we heard the sound of a steel chair connecting with someone's forehead? Oh man. As a kid, I never would have guessed that, but when The Undertaker walks in a room, you take notice. Those thoughts just go away. Sadly, the ancient Greeks did not have cage matches, turnbuckles, or personas based on hyper male confidence. What they did have, however, was some real wrestling, some bare knuckle, no clothes, oiled up kind of wrestling. Nice. Instead of a one leg up pin, a scoring system was used for when the opponent's body was on the ground. And I'm sure lots of people got injured in the process. Whew, no thanks. I'll stick to the cage matches. Number 8. Pank Ration. Here's another story for you. It might seem kind of silly, but growing up, I got to witness the birth of a mainstream sport. The UFC got its start in the early 90s, but blew up in the mid 2000s. Now, I'm not much of a sports guy. Besides major championship matches or games, I don't really watch any sports. I'm more of a film and video game guy, if you couldn't tell. However, my first interaction with the UFC was seeing an octagon shaped ring, and my grade 2 geometry immediately kicked in and said, that, that's an octagon. Wow, okay, that's different. However, the second thing that I noticed is that this was not wrestling, and this wasn't boxing. It was kind of a mixture of both. Sort of a mixed martial art, if you will. Well, that's kind of what Pank Ration was. There was no indirect punching or kicking, but pretty much anything else goes. To me, this sounds like a good way to get injured. Kind of like wrestling before, now it's just even worse. And as I'm sure you all know, paper cuts can be lethal back then, so maybe not such a good idea. Did I mention this is done without clothes too? There's everyone's everyone's naked. Number seven, the road trip. This isn't an Olympic event, but honestly, it should have been. Think about it for a minute. I want you guys to look out the nearest window right now. Get up, go ahead, look out the nearest window. Tell me what you see. You probably see a road with cars. When you need a fast food fix, it's as simple as getting in a car and driving on the road to your destination. Or getting it delivered with your favorite food delivery app. It's 2022, we can do a lot of crazy stuff now. What I'm getting at 
is that people from all over the Greek city-states came to Olympia to witness the first Olympics. Except, you know, it would have been a triathlon just to get there. Frankly, my biggest fear, walking. That was the main mode of transportation, which after a while in those sandals was probably hell. Imagine trekking many, many miles by land and sea to only be exhausted to watch athletes become exhausted. Oh, I need some water just thinking about it. Woo. Number six, peace. Peace. What's better than a good war? A better armistice, or at least I'd like to hope so. During these first Olympic Games, which on a side note, if I had a time machine and a scooter, I'd love to see firsthand. There was people and athletes coming from all corners of Hellenistic civilization, all Greek states and colonies. Well, sometimes these Greek states got caught up in these little things called wars. Who knew, right? But when the Olympics were on, a truce was called. Messengers were dispatched to announce the truce, which gave all the people traveling on their long treks safe passage. I also find it somewhat amusing that they did this all for one day. That's right, the events only lasted one day. Some folks did days of traveling only to have it all be over in 24 hours. The opening ceremony couldn't have taken that long either, so. I feel like it's kind of a waste of time. Only if we got some of that peace right now. Russia is looking at Ukraine a certain kind of way, just, just waiting to act up. Bad Russia, stay in your corner, won't they? Number five, Operation High Jump. Operation High Jump, officially named the United States Navy Antarctic Developments Program, launched in 1946 to 1947. An operation to establish an Antarctic research base organized by Admiral Richard E. Byrd. High Jump included 4,700 men, 13 ships, and 33 aircrafts. The war's end signaled the onset of the atomic age and a desire to secure supplies of uranium. With its almost unlimited mineral deposits, the largely unexplored territory of Antarctica was just the prize. It commenced 1946 and ended in late 1947. Or did it? Also known as Task Force 68, Bird and his team established the Little America 4 base near three previous bases in the ice. The frozen aircrafts would photograph as much of the Antarctic's land surface as possible during this three-month operation. Seems like the public thinks that high jump could have been more fishy than we think. Seems like skeptics are leaning towards more of a secret military expedition to the center of the Earth type stuff. Yep, apparently there's a mouth to the center of the planet in the Antarctic and there was a secret race to find it. High Jump is still today at the mercy of the internet on whether or not it was a legit project or a secretly funded scientific expedition. Google it up, it's pretty wild and very real. Number four, Ouija boards. Popularized by teens in the 1970s, the Ouija board has earned its reputation over the years. Created almost 100 years before its heightened popularity, the year is 1891. And as the first ads started to appear in papers claiming, quote, Ouija, the wonderful talking board. The title from a Pittsburgh toy and novelty shop. The first paper described it as a magical game that answered questions about the past, present, and future with marvelous accuracy. A flat board with the letters of the alphabet configured in two semicircles. Above, the numbers zero through nine. The words yes and no in the upper corners, goodbye at the bottom. No batteries included nor needed. Now. The origins are pretty messy, and it's hard to kind of pinpoint who or what inspired these early attempts at this game. It kind of just appeared on shelves. No, literally. The Kennard Novelty Company exclusively made and marketed these talking boards, and apparently the lore goes that one of the designer's sisters was a medium and asked the board what it would like to be called. It responded, Ouija, followed by, good luck. Well, that's absolutely terrifying. At least good sportsmanship though, right? Yeah, I've never played with one of these, nor will I ever. That's a no-brainer for me, 100%. Number three, the Philadelphia Experiment. I pray that this one is a hoax because there's a lot of documents that relate to this subject around the time that don't really seem to add up. The Philadelphia Experiment was an alleged event witnessed by Carl Allen and the United States Navy Shipyard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in October 1943. Allen describes an experiment where the U.S. Navy attempted to render itself invisible, cloaking the destroyer the USS Eldridge and the bizarre scientific results that followed. On Allen's account, the destroyer successfully made itself invisible, but the ship inexplicably teleported to Norfolk, Virginia for several minutes and then reappeared back in Philly. Sounds pretty cool, right? So what's the catch? The ship's crew was supposed to have suffered various side effects, including insanity, intangibility, and being frozen in place. Like people stuck in the walls and stuff. Stuck in the floors like this is a scene from Jumanji. 
terrifying. The story surfaced in the late 1950s when Allen sent a book full of handwritten letters referring to the experiment to a U.S. Navy research organization. The U.S. Navy maintains that there has been no such experiment ever conducted and that the details are highly exaggerated and falsified. Dude, I hope so, because this is horrifying. Number two, wow. In a 1959 paper, Cornell University physicists speculated that if an extraterrestrial civilization was attempting to communicate with us using radio signals, that they might use a frequency of 1420 megahertz, which is naturally emitted by hydrogen, the most common element in the universe. In 1973, Ohio State University assigned the Big Ear to the scientific search for extraterrestrial intelligence. 1977, Jerry Amon, a SETI volunteer astronomer, was analyzing data and spots a series of signal intensities and frequencies that left him and his colleagues astonished. The wow signal was the first signal detected from Earth. The signal came from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. Amon discovered the anomaly, impressed by the result. On the computer printout, he circled 6EQUJ5 and wrote three letters beside it. Wow. Leading to the event's famous name. The signal lasted for a full 72 seconds, and it remains today as the strongest candidate for an ET radio transmission ever detected. And number one, of course, the USS Cyclops. Launched in May of 1910, the USS Cyclops was a Protoss-class collier built for the United States Navy, a huge cargo ship designed for transporting coal. In 1918, the cursed vessel left Rio de Janeiro, heading for Barbados right around a certain dangerous triangle. Unfortunately, the Voyager was never to be seen again. Named Cyclops after a race of giants from Greek mythology, she was huge and heavy, unmissable by the naked eye. So what happened to her? The loss of the ship and crew still remains the single largest loss of life at sea the United States Navy has ever experienced. Funny thing is, it went right through the Bermuda Triangle, a place where Magnetic compasses stop working, ships are never heard from again, and of course the military still refuses to operate and research. Skeptics are quick to say aliens and black holes, but the magnetism surrounding the Bermuda Triangle cases might be a logical explanation. I think they still owe us some explanations, no? I'm looking at you, Freedom of Information Act. Number 10. Chandragupta I's Marriage to Kumara Devi One of the first major acts of the Gupta Empire was certainly the first to cement its authority. As Chandragupta I married the Lachavi princess Kumara Devi, he solidified relations between Nepal and India, creating a unique position at the time that allowed for the Gupta's coming expansion. It's theorized that this may not have been a happy marriage, as numismatist John Allen implies that it was a condition of a peace treaty with the Lachavi, which Manu Samhita claims were impure in the Gupta's eyes. Despite that, Chandragupta and Kumara Devi are featured prominently on the coins of the time, which was likely a display of power. Number 9. Samudragupta Following Chandragupta's rule came the rule of Samudragupta, the child of the previous union. Compared to his father, Samudragupta expanded the empire's borders with gusto, to the point where scholars frequently refer to him as the Napoleon of India. Not only that, but a number of recordings describe him as an accomplished artist and a kind ruler who deeply cared for the poor. A great number of coins were minted in his name, featuring him in various poses, and likely cemented him as a classical Indian historical hero, reinstating the royal families of those who lost their kingdoms, whether by his hand or not, it didn't matter. Number eight. Religious Tolerance But Samudragupta was not just a man of the people, he was a man deeply involved with religion. An active worshipper of Vishnu, many records of his achievements have been gleaned from the records of him installing idols to his god in the temples of cities that he'd conquered. That being said, he was known to be extremely religiously tolerant, allowing and actively encouraging other practitioners to worship in his kingdom. One of Samudragupta's favorite rituals was the ritual of Ashvamedha, a ritual where a horse would be released by the king's warriors and left to wander for a year. If the horse entered any rival territory, they could challenge the warriors accompanying the horse. If the horse couldn't be captured or killed within a year, it would be returned to the capital and sacrificed, and the king declared as the sovereign. 
Number 7. Art Peak I have to stop talking about Samudragupta, but this is a really good reason to. The Gupta Empire was an absolute golden age, in particular for art. Sculpture was easily at its finest here. Just look at the Buddha of the Mathura style. Carved from pink sandstone, these sculptures are so insanely detailed for the material that they're working with. Like, look at the folds on the fabric. Oh my god. A another piece that stands out is the terracotta depiction of Krishna battling Keshi, an absolutely stunning work of action and motion. Not only were the sculptures incredible, but the paintings were fascinating as well, such as the ones from the Ajanta Caves, works of dry fresco. Only a handful of these caves have survived time's cruelty, but the ones that have are remarkable indeed. Number 6. The Allahabad Pillar One of the most important pieces of Indian architecture, the Allahabad Pillar is a massive stone where the exploits of numerous Indian rulers have been inscribed. Constructed from stone, the pillar is thought to have been erected in the 3rd century by the Ashoka, but carries an absolutely staggering amount of history etched onto its surface. Many of the original inscriptions have been lost to time and weather, but many more have survived, least of all the verses detailing the exploits of our boy, Samudragupta. Every single thing that we know about the Gupta can either be gleaned from excavating coins from the time, the documentation of visiting foreign elements, but the majority of it is found here. Relaying all of his exploits would take far too long, as Samudragupta conquered well over 20 kingdoms during his reign, inscribing verses dedicated to them on the Allahabad pillar. In our number 5 spot today we have the internment camps. During World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which would cause 117,000 Japanese Americans to have to give up their homes, jobs, and businesses and move to internment camps. This was due to the fear of espionage after Pearl Harbor. This was truly one of the worst violations of civil rights in the 20th century, and the government didn't apologize for it until decades later, but they cited national security as the justification for their actions. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning as other countries began to follow suit, with Canada, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina all having their own versions of this same kind of atrocity. It is very surprising to me that this isn't something that is discussed more often, as it is, of course, something something that would prove detrimental to the Japanese American community for decades to come. In our number 4 spot today we have the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. New York City's Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in 1911 was an unbelievably terrible incident that led to changes being made for factory workers in America. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of a building in Greenwich Village, and it of course was where shirtwaists were made, which we would now call a woman's blouse. I call this place a factory but it was definitely more like a sweatshop, and the employees were mostly comprised of young women. So, like I mentioned before, in 1911 there was unfortunately a fire that broke out on the 8th floor, and because of the very cramped and unsafe working conditions, the fire ended up claiming the lives of 146 people that day. After more details came out about the incident and how the terrible working conditions were mostly to blame for the amount of lives that were lost, protests broke out all around the city. People began demanding better for the women who had to work in these kinds of places. Like, just as an example, the doors to the stairwells and exits were locked so that employees couldn't take unauthorized breaks. How unbelievable is that? And the worst part is that the owners of the company, who were largely responsible for what happened that day, basically just got off scot free. If you want to know more about this fateful day, the amazing podcast My Favorite Murder by Georgia Hardstark and Karen Kilgariff has an episode that does a wonderful job covering it. In our number three spot today, we have Bikini Island. Bikini Bikini Island is located within the Marshall Islands, and it was once the home to around 170 islanders. In 1940, the US President at the time, Harry Truman, ordered that the military test their nuclear weapons in the case of a future where they would be deemed necessary, since World War II had just ended and people were of course feeling concerned about what the future would hold. Since Bikini was located in a place where ships and planes don't normally travel very close to, unfortunately it was the spot chosen for this testing site. The residents of the 
Ireland were asked to vacate, quote, for the good of mankind and to end all world wars. To which they of course obliged under the impression that they would one day be able to move back. After this, the testing began and in 1954, the US military detonated Castle Bravo, which is one of the most powerful weapons at 15 megatons. There were 22 other weapons that were detonated on this island as well, so it's safe to say this place got a ton of nuclear activity, which left it with extremely high levels of radiation. This left residents unable to return for much longer than anticipated, with the first returning in the 70s. But of course, shortly after these poor people moved back, they realized that the island still had totally unsafe levels of radiation, making it still unfit to live on, which has left it still uninhabited. In our number two spot today, we have strange medicine. It's not necessarily uncommon for us to hear about strange things that people in the past used to do, but sometimes those strange things are also disgusting. It was extremely common in the past for people to use human remains as a form of medicine. These gruesome treatments would consist of things such as blood, ground up human skull, and even human fat. Tomb Raiders would even steal remains in order for them to be sold to the wealthy, which is incredibly dark, and apparently mummy remains were the ideal remains for these sorts of things, which then led to a shortage of mummies. Never thought I'd be in a position where I'd be talking about a shortage of mummies, but truly anything can happen over here on Bumblebee. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have a sticky situation. Okay, so this one is less of an event, more of just a historical invention that absolutely should not have existed, and that is the sticky bomb. After the British hurriedly evacuated France in 1940, they were facing the threat of German invasion and had come up with some weapons that could be used against tanks. Thus, the sticky grenade or sticky bomb was born. It was formally called the anti-tank hand grenade number 74, and basically the design was that there was a metal outer shell that covered a bomb coated in adhesive. The idea was to have the user pull a pin to remove the metal casing, where they could then run up to a tank, use the sticky adhesive to stick it to the tank, activate the five second fuse, and get the heck out of there. Or they could just throw it and hope it's stuck. Well, there's a few problems with this design. The first one that I'm sure all of us can understand is that uh, the adhesive didn't want to stick to anything dusty or wet or muddy, which are all things that happen to be common on tanks. You know what they did like to stick to though? Human skin. Unfortunately, this invention could prove much more detrimental to the person who was attempting to use it. Despite these very obvious and dangerous flaws, it was still used by a few different armed forces, but I don't think anyone has used it in recent history, which is truthfully probably for the best. Kick it off the list at number 10, black cats. Yeah, we'll start this dark list off a little slowly. You know, we'll ease our way into the witch trials. You see a black cat cross in front of you, what's the first thing you think? Bad luck, bad omens, bad stuff? Does that cat belong to anyone? Maybe I should take it home and take care of it. Well, in 1232, Pope Gregory the Ninth, he exposed a cult of witches in Northern Germany. Yeah, he wrote an expose called Vox in Rama. He went in deep, he knew some of the ritual words used at these cult meetings. He knew everything, which in my opinion, a little fishy, right? This guy knows a lot. Were you involved, my dude? What's going on? He exposed the happenings, including the involvement of one black cat. They would oddly kiss it and worship it. Now at first when reading about this, I was like, oh no, the cat, what's gonna happen? No, it's good. It was cat worship in this way, which is odd, but better historically. The Pope did afterwards send hunters out to eliminate any cat in sight, so it is pretty dark and scandalous. The level of cats in the mid 1200s was almost at an extinct level. Pretty horrible, right? If only we had all those cats later on in 1347 when, you know, rats carrying the Black Death arrived. We definitely could have used a few cats, but eh, witches. Number nine, Flat Earth. Okay, it's 2022. We can watch live footage right now from the International Space Station just whipping around us. We can fly to Australia in this day and age. We can have a window seat and watch the entire commute. But there's still a good amount of people today that believe that the Earth is flat. How shocking is that? How scandalous indeed. The same guys who believed women were witches were also like, Oh, of course the earth isn't flat, that's crazy. How conflicting is that historically? We think any time before Columbus, especially back in the dark ages, we have this general idea that they didn't know anything, specifically the scale of the planet or even the universe for that matter. We're still launching telescopes into space to record the edges of the galaxy. There's so much we don't know today, yet there's still flat earthers. Shocking enough, the middle ages didn't see many of those. In the 13th century, navigators were regarding the earth as a sphere with four cardinal points as well, even going back 
further, looking at ancient Roman days in 77 AD, Pliny the Elder, the ancient philosopher, also agreed on the Earth's shape. It was common knowledge, dare I say, even in the Dark Ages. So if you know any flat earthers, send them this link. And then also send them a link of the ISS. I don't know. Number eight, red hair problems. All right, if you're a redhead out there, I'm sorry about this one. I had to, I had to talk about it. History can be ugly sometimes, and more often than not, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Historically, urine has been used for the greater good. Teeth whitening, Roman laundry days, urine makes leather soft, we get it. The Spanish Inquisition brought with them the idea that red hair was a sign of witchcraft. Yeah, the sign of the devil himself. The manuscripts published at that time about redheads too didn't help, they were horrible. The Proverbs of Alfred warns against having a redhead as a friend. And then another manuscript, Secretum Secretorum, warns against using redheads as advisors. Yeah, not even a work friend. Sorry, Big Chad. Ooh. 14th century manuscripts tell me that you're working for the devil, so now we can't talk to you, all because you have nice hair. Another manuscript from the 14th century believes that redheads are rarely faithful in both friendships and romantic relationships. Yeah, if you have a redhead partner, don't go through their phone, okay? Don't listen to the Spanish Inquisition, okay? Don't listen to the devil. They're not working for the devil, okay? They're, they're just fine, they're, they're, they're redheads. Freckles as well, if you had freckles in the Middle Ages, Good game. Number seven, Macbeth's curse. Every curse starts somewhere, okay? All you theater kids out there probably know about this one. I feel guilty talking about this, here we go. There's a few things you can't say to an actor before a show, and oddly enough, good luck is one of them. Yeah, you're supposed to say break a leg. All these theater traditions you can't break, okay? You're about to go on and do Shakespeare, and do like this huge monologue wearing funky shoes. You gotta be in the zone, okay? You gotta. You know, it's like game day. Even actors have their playoff beards, you know what I mean? It's like a ritual, you gotta stick to it. This legend goes back to 1606, the time of Macbeth's first performance. The actor playing Lady Macbeth died right before the show, sadly, so Shakespeare had to step in and play the part himself. Now apparently at this time, a coven of witches cursed the show. Yeah, since then there's been tales of real daggers being used in the show accidentally instead of prop daggers. The Astor Place riot in New York City back in 1849, that was caused by rival actors both playing Macbeth in their respective productions. There's also countless amount of stories recalling botched performances of the play, but what do we think? Is this the case of being in your own head and we just never dropped it, or is the Macbeth curse real? I don't know. COVID of witches cursing plays. That sounds pretty, pretty medieval. I hope it's not real. That would suck. I just got cursed. Number six, witches curse. Ah, more curses. Let's do it. From the 1400s to the 1700s alone, there were around 50,000 individuals who were all found guilty of witchcraft and wizardry. And we all know what that meant. But how many of those were actual witches? Like really, was this a real thing? Were any of them actually found guilty? Was any of them the red woman from Game of Thrones? Like, you know. Was, did she do anything? We'll start with a woman named Mother Shipton. Mother Shipton, AKA Ursula Southiel. She was a clairvoyant from the 16th century, England's greatest, if that. Her mother as well was a widely known uh, witch which is a little dark. But Ursula, she was good at her job. She was often compared to Nostradamus. So she was using her passed on abilities for the greater good. Again, greater good, the middle age greater good. She predicted the execution of Mary Queen of Scots and she also predicted the internet. Yeah, in the 16th century, she predicted that thoughts around the world shall fly in the twinkling of an eye. It rhymes, so you know she was on a good streak. Mother Shipton actually passed away a peaceful death, believe it or not. She wasn't hunted down by a mob or anything like that. She was actually buried on unholy grounds in 1560 which is insanely bizarre for a witch at any time. And the fact that people compared her to Nostradamus and she wasn't, you know, shocking. Dare I say, we have a good one. A nice good one for a halfway point. Number five, sticky situation. The molasses flood of 1919 sounds like a lot of sweet fun, but it was actually a horrific event. And not just for diabetics, it was uncomfortable for two reasons. Reason number one being that 21 people lost their lives at what must have been the most confusing thing ever to see. A rush of sticky molasses flooded the streets of Boston and caused a crazy amount of damage. Reason number two being, well, how this occurred in the first place. I'll give the folks at home a second to take a guess at how they think it happened. Ready? If you said workplace neglect, congratulations, you win bragging rights. Basically, it was foobar from the start. The large tank that held the sweet stuff wasn't built properly, wasn't properly inspected by professionals. No one really understood, I guess, that fermentation produces gas, which made an already unsafe tank more unsafe. And well, there you go, boom, an unholy sticky flood. Probably one of the biggest lessons in work safety history. And let's be honest, who wants to swim in molasses? You never get out of it. Number four, broken arrow. The Cold War wasn't exactly cold as nuclear weapons had the potential to make it hot. 
too hot. So here's something to make everyone lose a little more sleep at night because I know everyone at home is stress free right now and gets a full eight hours of sleep. Tonight when you lay your wee head to rest on count sheep, I want you to think about Broken Arrow. No, not actually a Broken Arrow, but the Broken Arrow incident or incidents, which if you didn't know is the code phrase for a nuclear device gun MIA. For example, on July 28th, a US aircraft from Dover Air Force Base, Delaware was carrying three nuclear bombs over the Atlantic Ocean. The plane experienced a loss of power and the crew jettisoned two nuclear bombs into the ocean and they have never been recovered. Wow, that's great. There were at least another dozen broken arrow incidents from the 1950s until the end of the Cold War. Now, as bad as that sounds, I mean, it's pretty bad. These are our nukes we're talking about. At least America's lost bombs were recorded. Nobody really knows how many bombs the Soviet Union lost during the Cold War. Gee, now I feel real swell and safe. Number three, Ik bin ein Belena. This may be old news to those of our older audience, but news to younger. And honestly, it's crazy that it even happened in the first place. So World War II ends, right? And the Allies are all super good friends, right? Wrong! Berlin basically gets split into two, Capitalist West and Communist East. So the Cold War kicks off, a very strong disagreement on what political and economical structure is better. As it turns out, life was just better on the West. People in the East just didn't have access to certain things the West did. So people started bailing shit. I don't blame them. So much so that a wall was built dividing the two. This may not sound like much, but it was huge. The Berlin Wall divided families, business, and put on the full display of failure that communism was. As JFK said, democracy is not perfect, but we've never had to put a wall up to keep our people in. And honestly, the guy's right. That's just kind of crazy. Number two, can't beat them, join them. Japan was the new cool kid in school, and by that, I mean they were the most powerful force in Asia in the late 1930s. Japan rapidly adopted westernized ideas, structures, and the old habit of invading foreign nations, and wrecking absolute havoc when there. Specifically, Nanking in 1937. Some historians consider this to be the beginning of World War II, but it's debatable. What's not debatable is the uncomfortable way Imperial Japanese forces treated Chinese civilians. Japan was expanding during the early 20th century, and China was next on the schedule. I'm gonna recommend you Google this one at home, as there is so much naughty stuff about Nanking in 1937 that I'd get the censors a headache just thinking about it. There's a really infamous photograph that you probably haven't seen, and it's 100% not safe for work. The invasion of China and incidents like that of Nanking still have sour relations between the two nations today. Number one, the world is yours. Okay, so kind of a broad stroke here, but very fitting. I'm putting everything the British Empire did at the number one spot. I mean, come on, guys, it's the British Empire. Sure, it's no secret what they did, but there's so much to unpack here. It's a lot. Redcoats have been making things uncomfortable since the late 1600s. The American colonies and how they treated Indians, the occupation of actual India, and the opium wars in China, just to name a few. At its height, the British Empire had conquered 25% of the Earth's land surface. And like I always say, when you get that big, you gotta break a few eggs along the way to make your omelet. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the rich remains. When we think of the story of the Titanic, we of course think of the sinking of the ship, we talk about how the survivors were saved, and then of course, we think of the catastrophic loss of life. Many people don't really stop to ask, what happened with all of those who passed in the tragedy, however? More than 1,500 passed away in the sinking of the Titanic, and only 337 bodies were pulled out of the water. A scholar named Jess Beer has recently examined what was done with those bodies, and through this research, they have come to realize that whether or not these people got identified and what happened to their remains in the end all depended on their class and economic standing in life. About one third of the recovered bodies ended up being returned to see because the rescuers didn't think that they would get any sort of life insurance payout from the families of those who had passed and who were of a lower economic standing. For any bodies to be preserved for land burial, the remains had to be easily identifiable and they needed to have a quote economic value even after death with a high social or economic worth. In our number 9 spot today we have the Titanic radio. This is a piece of the ship that has not yet been recovered but it's the focus of much debate on whether or not it should be retrieved from the wreckage. Known in 1912 as the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Machine, the radio on the Titanic sent distress calls to nearby ships that ended up saving the lives of 700 people in lifeboats. Despite how many people died in the Titanic tragedy, there were debates about whether or not to retrieve the artifact because of the fact that there might still be huge
human remains located in the same area as the radio is. Lawyers have argued against the recovery of the radio because the dive plan did not include the prospect of there being human remains located down there. It also was argued because in order to retrieve it, they would need to cut into the ship's radio compartment, which was strongly opposed by preservation advocates. As of right now, it appears as though the dive to retrieve the radio will still occur, but in the end, the pandemic delayed things quite a bit, so at this point, it isn't clear exactly when. This radio would be a very valuable artifact, but it would also hold a really eerie tale of exactly when and how the radio was used during the final moments of the Titanic. In our number 8 spot today, we have the heads up. I'm not sure why, but for actual years, I thought that on the day of the Titanic sinking, the iceberg they hit just kind of came out of nowhere and surprised them. So imagine my surprise when I found out that that wasn't true even in the slightest. Turns out the entire thing absolutely could have been avoided. The crew had received six warnings about the iceberg before the collision. While the first few warnings were received by the captain, not all of them were, and it's not totally clear why. Although the crew knew about the icy conditions of the water, they didn't slow down much, which some have called a reckless decision, but apparently this actually was standard practice at the time, so I suppose you can't really blame them. The final warning, however, was received from a ship that had halted for the night due to an ice field a few miles away. Way, and when the message was being relayed to the captain, he cut it off and said to shut up as he was working Cape Race. In our number 7 spot today, we have a love letter. Richard Geddes was a cabin attendant on the Titanic who wrote a love letter to his wife while aboard, but unfortunately she would never go on to receive it. The letter was written on the original Titanic stationery, and it even had its original white star line envelope when it was found. While this story in itself is of course extremely sad, and again one of those reminders of the human side of those who were in this incident, this letter also contained something else besides utterings and confessions of of love. It also featured a description that Richard wrote for his wife of a near collision that the Titanic had with the SS city of New York, obviously prior to this terrible iceberg incident. There were people who had witnessed this near collision and believed that it was a bad omen for the Titanic. In our number 6 spot today, we have the emergency systems. The time from the point where the ship actually hit the iceberg until the first lifeboats were launched was an entire hour. That is way too long when it is an emergency agency of this magnitude, which obviously leaves us wondering why. Well, as it turns out, a lot of people thought that the alarm bells were actually just a drill and they stayed inside where it was warm. This is already terrible, but what's even worse is that for the people who didn't think it was a drill, they had absolutely no idea where to go or what to do in the case of an emergency. They had never done any lifeboat drills, so everyone was just panicking with nowhere to go. Due to this lifeboat delay, there wasn't enough time to launch all of the remaining lifeboats successfully. There were even two boats that never got launched at all. That is obviously terrible because there are so many people who potentially could have been saved had this delay never happened. I also just can't imagine how frightening it would have been to be in the middle of that emergency with absolutely no direction at all. Number 5. Tanks Ok, so after a few Olympics, people got tired of walking those many many miles just to see some dudes run a mile. We need more events, said the Olympic organizers, but what? We have athletes running, what else is there? Ok, ok, I hear you. What if we get athletes to run, but with full military armor and gear on? Yeah, that's right. There was another race where athletes would wield the armor of the Greek soldiers and race. I can imagine that there was a clunking noise, or at least a lot of it, and also how difficult it must be to run in bronze armor. I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret. Come a little closer. A little closer. A little closer. Whoa, too close. Bronze armor isn't good for chafing. Cause let me tell you something, hot Mediterranean sun, not a lot of water, and running in hot metal attire? Someone's gonna have to come over and put baby powder on my bum bum. Number 4, the classic. I don't know why, but when I think of ancient Greeks, I think of grapes on the vine, marble, chariots, and, and the movie 300. It's, it's kind of hard to forget those spray on abs. Although someone could put them on me, kind of nice. Equestrian events were another event of the ancient Greek Olympics, and I have something nice to say about something for once. While every other event was dominated by males, because, well, only males were allowed to compete, of course, the equestrian events allowed women. Nice! And naturally, ladies, when someone points the spotlight on you, you shine. A notable winner of the event was Sinisica, a Spartan princess and athlete who was an excellent horse breeder. 
I guess that's a nice thing to remember by. According to some records, two monuments were built in honor of her victory. I rode a horse once. I can firmly say that I prefer the automobile. Just saying. You walk around like that, that's why all the cowboys walk like this. You just do that all that. Number three, the long jump. After running and running in armor, it was discovered that jumping makes for a great Olympic event. How high, how far? It's simple, really. It should come as no surprise that I did not perform well in that section of track and field day at school. To my disadvantage, there was no strength-based events because it was considered unhealthy for us because we were so young. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that. My counter to that argument would be, why are you making tubby kids run the 1500 meter? That's liable to have the kid with asthma writing his math test in the hospital bed later. I'd probably be joining him. However, I am a supporter of the Ancient Greek jumping event. Basically, athletes gotta jump as far as they can whilst holding two large rocks. Now, if we did that today, people would know what it's like to do a long jump when grandma feeds you too much. Yeah, it's not easy. Number two, the discus, the javelin, and the hammer. Sounds like a good band. Hey, these are all events that we still compete in today. That's awesome. But doesn't it make you nervous when the athletes are throwing those bad boys around? Especially the hammer throw. God, it just makes me so nervous. While I couldn't find an exact example of an accident happening, I doubt the ancient Greeks had safety in mind for spectators. The discus was made from stone or bronze, and they were tossing those suckers the same way Guy Fieri tosses Caesar salad which is a lot because he's kind of a big guy too. However, for me, it's the javelin that's most terrifying, as that was an appropriate weapon of war for the time. And athletes are just throwing them around like it's nothing. You're telling me the crowd was a safe distance away from the splash zone? Yeah, just keep your eye on the sky to be safe, folks. I don't know about that. Number one, rap battle. Honestly, this is something we should bring back to the Olympics. While I was complaining about not being able to compete in strength-based events earlier, I, as a theater kid, would have much preferred some of the other less intensive events the ancient Greeks had up to offer. The ancient Greeks were not just chucking stones and chafing in bronze armor. There was also a competition with the arts, poetry, song, and singing. Imagine if America entered Eminem into a rap battle contest. There would be no contest. Imagine if Canada entered one for musicians. KD Lang, Celine Dion, oh, and Anne Murray. Just singing angels. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Rhode Island Vampire. In the late 1800s, tuberculosis was spreading rapidly in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Vermont. This obviously would have been pretty terrifying for the residents of these places, but things quickly took a very dark turn. Since many of the people who were passing away from this illness appeared very obviously ill with sunken, drained faces, for some reason, the logical response was that people believed they had been the prey of vampires. There was a family in Exeter, Rhode Island that had multiple people pass away from the illness, so then people believed that someone in the family must be feeding the vampire. They even went as far as to exhume the bodies of some of the deceased family members to make sure that they weren't undead. One of the exhumed bodies had passed away more recently, so her body was in a better condition, which people, of course, took as a sign of her being a vampire. This led them to burn her heart and liver, and then mix the ashes with water. This is most definitely a crime today, and pretty scary, but to make things even worse, they gave this concoction to other people in the town who had fallen ill as some kind of a cure. Imagine having to drink that and then still having tuberculosis after. Definitely not a good trade off. In our number 9 spot today, we have the history of dentures. Personally, I don't have a ton of experience with dentures, but they seem to be a pretty straightforward thing these days, aside from the cost of dental, of course. But things weren't always the way that they are today. Instead of dentures being made of fake teeth before, they used to be made with real human teeth, which is absolutely disgusting. After the Battle of Waterloo, scavengers went and took the teeth off of corpses, which is quite a job, and then they sold these teeth to dentists. The dentists would boil the teeth, chop the roots off, and then attach these teeth to ivory base plates and then sell them to customers. Aside from this being an extremely morally questionable practice in its entirety, it's also just very creepy. In our number 8 spot today, we have the smallpox spread. I'm sure at some point or another, most of us learned about smallpox and the epidemic, which is something that we luckily don't really have to worry about much anymore. But one thing a lot of people explained that they didn't know was how badly it devastated indigenous peoples. Europeans who came over to America brought with them a multitude of diseases that they would have had some immunity 
too, considering it was likely their bodies had encountered it before. But this was not the case for those already living on the land that is now referred to as North America. Indigenous Americans not only had no immunity towards this disease, but also the traditional ways of treating illness may have only exacerbated the symptoms. Because of course, how could you possibly know how to treat something that you've literally never seen before and with no help from the people who do actually know how? It has been estimated that the spread of disease caused the population of indigenous Americans to decline by 70%. There is a theory that the spread of disease may have been one of the only things that led to the colonization of North America. In our number 7 spot today we have the Tulsa riot. This event occurred on May 31st and June 1st of 1921 and it has actually been called the single worst incident of racial violence in American history. This happened in the Greenwood district of Tulsa, Oklahoma and basically just mobs of white racist people went out and attacked black residents and businesses. What started this was when a 19 year old black man named Dick Rowland was accused of harming a white girl and he was subsequently arrested and there were rumors that he was going to be lynched. This of course drew a bunch of racist white people out of their homes to participate but then a group of around 75 black men showed up to make sure that he didn't get lynched. One thing led to another and a firefight broke out that led to 10 of the white people and two of the black people being killed. After this, all hell broke loose. In 2020, the last living survivor of the massacre, R&B and jazz saxophonist Hal Singer, a total legend, passed away at the age of 100. In the same year, this massacre finally became a part of the Oklahoma State curriculum, and it's about time, only a century too late. In our number 6 spot today, we have Heraclitus of Ephesus. Heraclitus was an ancient Greek philosopher who helped push the notion that the universe is in constant change, as well as the unity of opposites where the universe is a system of balance exchanges. This is all fine and well, but where things get a little troublesome is in his own personal life. You see, the thing is, is that he was a misanthrope, and his dislike for humankind led him to having long stretches where he was quite isolated. He would wander through the wilderness alone, surviving on plants and other things that he could scavenge. In the end, he came down with a pretty terrible and painful illness called dropsy, which is an accumulation of fluid underneath the skin. Doctors were unfortunately unable to help him, so he took matters into his own hands. He decided to cover himself in cow dung under the belief that as it dried, it would draw the moisture out from under his skin. This could have been a genius idea, albeit super gross, but things took a very, very dark turn. Covered in the dung, he laid out in the sun to dry, but the dung created a body cast and left him unable to move. This inability to move also left him unable to shoo off the pack of wild dogs that ended up surrounding him. So unfortunately, he was eaten alive. I guess I can understand why this one may have been left out of history class. Number 5. Destiny? I, for one, am not a believer in destiny. I believe that if you want something bad enough, you can take it and make it yours. But in a modern world, I think we all carve our own path. Not to get too Marty McFly on you, but have you ever thought of a choice you made when you could have made another? Like what if I didn't have Taco Bell on my 21st birthday? Would I still have vomited after those 12 tequila shots? I'll never know. But one choice, or rather blunder, changed the world as we know it is the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. Triggered World War I, which caused World War II, which caused the Cold War, which is why we live in a globalist world where technology and economy have redefined everything we know. Franz's driver took a wrong turn in his car and ended up beside one of the amateur assassins. All that just from one bullet, one man. Who knows what would have happened if that turn wasn't made? Guess we'll never know. Anyone down for some Taco Bell? Number 4. The Bay of Pigs Cuba becoming a communist country in America's backyard was scary. I mean, what if they tried to spread the idea of free healthcare? I'm just kidding. In a world of mutually assured nuclear destruction, this was actually pretty bad. So before things could get any worse, the CIA put together a crack team of anti-Fidel Cubans supplied with American weapons and training. And so the Bay of Pigs invasion commenced. However, after reducing the amount of air support to aid in the landings in hopes that it would clear America of any involvement, not sure how that works, the CIA force was quickly defeated and even had Castro boasting his cadre's effectiveness on the battlefield as it was coming to a close. It was not a good look for America, as it seemed the communists really might be more powerful. Not to worry though, Google how many of those countries are left. We came out on top. Just took, you know, 70 years and a bunch of wars, but we came out on top. 
Number three, the glove. Michael Jackson's one glove look was the second famous glove next to OJ Simpson's glove during the trial of the death of his wife, Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. Despite evidence pointing him being guilty, the verdict came in not guilty. Millions of people tuned into what was called the trial of the century. No matter how you feel about the verdict, it can be uncomfortable to talk about as two people were still killed and their killer may still be on the loose. I mean, there's also a book that he wrote called If I Did It. All I'm saying is if I took a cookie from the cookie jar, I wouldn't tell my mom a story about a little chubby kid going to get a cookie in the cookie jar. Number two, Avast Sea Land Lovers. Pirates, literally any one of them really, but most famously the Pirates of the Caribbean. Despite how cool Disney and Johnny Depp make pirates look good, they were actually a nasty lot. Sure, maybe not the worst, but at the end of the day, they weren't great. Crooks, criminals, terrors of the sea. Blackbeard, probably the most infamous pirate besides Jack Sparrow, raided many ships in his time, and he didn't exactly ask nicely. Oh, and they'll relate down to number one as well. You guys will like this one. Number one, hygiene. You guys love hygiene. I can tell from watching Taylor's videos. There's like six parts. But think about it for a moment. Think about what the average person smelled like before 1850. No indoor plumbing, no regular bathing, and no Irish Spring. I gotta have my Irish Spring. For me, I always think how uncomfortable the room must have been on that summer day signing the Declaration of Independence. Here you go, John Hancock, sign here and take a bath, man. A lot of history's defining moments were also probably the stinkiest.